All right, now for what was in the book and then some other things I figured out along the way. Um, I'm going to skip uh, the first part of the book, which has to do with the father of American psychological warfare, Edward Lansdale. Interesting guy, but um, he doesn't make the cut in the interest of time, but it did, uh, it did, uh, it was an interesting story, first couple of chapters. Anyway, the, the book really opens up uh, about Laos, because Laos was the issue, not Vietnam at the time. And um, what Kennedy was being told, uh, Eisenhower told Kennedy that he would have to intervene in Laos. The, the, the uh, communist forces, the Pat Thet Lao, uh, reinforced by North Vietnamese regulars, uh, were getting control of Laos. And it, it's landlocked by a bunch of important countries, Cambodia, um, Thailand and South Vietnam, and all the trails into those countries could have seriously threatened the existence of all those, uh, the entire uh, Southeast Asian Peninsula. And so, but Kennedy said, no, I don't want to do that. I'd rather work out a neutral solution in Laos. And so they told him, okay, if you want to do that, we're going to have to uh, knock the snot out of them first and then negotiate from a position of strength. And he can really have a neutral Laos. And uh, are, are the pro-American forces in Laos are prepared to do that? Fumi's forces, the pro-American forces in Laos. It'll take them about three days to, to, to cut to pieces the, the Patet Lao, and then we'll be fine. <laughs> and so uh, what happened was um, the national intelligence estimate saying that was written in order to tell the policymakers, like the president and, and others, uh, what the situation was. And um, I did that, uh, by the way, for NSA for years on East Asia. I sat at the table at the CIA at the intelligence estimates and represented uh, what I knew in the agency uh, on lots of them. Anyway, in this, you, in this particular case, um, uh, there were two army officers present who worked for the chief army systems chief of staff for intelligence who came from the North Vietnam desk and they told the drafter Abbott Smith I, I said Mr. A I didn't put his full name in my book it says Mr. A but I know he was the drafter that the estimate was very flawed that we had intelligence from a much higher level and he's talking about signals intelligence and human intelligence that showed that Fumi's uh, troops would lose easily. And see, uh, and so, but, but Abbott refused to clear the room of the unclear folks and the estimate went forward as written and, uh, and, th and so the, this fight occurred and it took, it took the Pat Tetlau about three days uh, to, actually there wasn't much of a fight. After a few shots the, the Fumi's forces broke and ran, threw the rifles down and swam across the river. What, so Kennedy was told a, a false story. This is actually what was happening. And that was not shown or shared with Kennedy. Where's my thing? I don't know my pointer. Can't find it. Oh, well. Anyway, this, even from back there, this looks very bad, doesn't it? Here's North Vietnam. Here's Laos. And this is Soviet airlift. Thank you. Soviet airlift. And they are putting thousands of, of North Vietnamese regulars down here with the Pat Thet Lao all over Laos just before this, this battle that they're telling Kennedy that the that Fubi's forces are going to win. So they're, they're telling him a, a, a complete lie about what's going to happen here and not letting him know this is what's happening. Okay? And so after the loss, here's one of Kennedy's first press conferences. I uh, can't, sorry, I can't make it any bigger, but uh, there it is. He's got a pointer, and he's standing in front of a map of Laos telling the public what happened. That, uh, and now we're in real trouble, because they've got the plane of jars. They've got, they got everything. And so now, backed up against the corner, Kennedy does do what Eisenhower told him to do. He authorizes this huge buildup of forces. We had something like it called Desert Shield before uh, the war in, in Iraq. Well, back then it was, uh, I forget what the code name was. Anyway, the same thing. Every ship in the Pacific sailed for the Gulf of Siam and, and uh, uh, about 100,000 Marines uh, that were going to come wait ashore. Uh, Cedo Plan 5. 
Yeah, I'm just going to plant a fire. They're going to wade ashore across Vietnam, and then a huge airborne force is going to be dropped in there um, into the mountains of, of, of Laos. And um, so that's going on. Now Kennedy has blinked. He said no. And based on faulty intelligence, he said yes, backed up against the wall. And so all these guys around him, the generals in the Pentagon and the folks over at the CIA, they saw Kennedy change his mind. Okay? Guess what's happening while this is going on? Cuba. All right? So, um, do we have any? Yeah, just wait, just wait uh, uh, for Cuba. Yeah, I'll just put it on pause. So, what's happening is, and I have to, to race to the end of the story because I, otherwise I'm going to talk for an hour on the Eisenhower administration and the whole buildup for what we now know was the Bay of Pigs disaster. So, Kennedy comes in, it's, the plan's already on the table, and he agrees to go along with it, or at least to. to initially to be briefed about it, and he never says no, and eventually says yes, but what, what's happening is it's based on lies again. He is told by the Pentagon chiefs and by the top people at the CIA that this invasion, this brigade of exiles will succeed when they land. And he is told also that there will be a general uprising across the entire island against Castro. The, that was known to be false. I have the documents. I've actually got a FOIA lawsuit going uh, to get some more of them out of the C CIA. Um, they figured out before Kennedy was even elected that uh, that, lie, that, that that idea of, a, of an uprising was complete crap. It was never going to happen. And along the way, the other part of it, whether or not the exile brigade force would succeed upon the beachhead, um, they knew, the, the, the Pentagon knew, uh, and told the truth for exactly one meeting, their very first meeting with Kennedy. It'll never work. This is a CIA plan, and a paramilitary plan, and it can't possibly succeed against Castro's forces. And which was having all kinds of stuff poured in, tanks and artillery and, 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 and a lot more equipment by the month during this time. And so they told him the truth. It'll never work. Well, about at the second meeting, when Kennedy starts demurring and folding his arms and not saying very much, trying to keep his cards close to the vest, they read him correctly. If they don't stop telling him, if they, if, if, if they don't stop telling him the truth about Laos and Vietnam, he's going he's to abort, excuse me, Cuba, he's going to abort Cuba, and he's going to go... Uh, uh, neutral again for, for um, Laos. And so they lied to him about on both fronts. And um, the worst part of the story is the air cover. You probably those who know anything about the pigs have heard about the fact that we canceled the air strikes that was going to take out Castro's Air Force. And that is true. Uh, and the president was part of that. So it was the Secretary of State Dean Russ. But the part that I had never learned before that I now know about and I wrote about it in volume two of my present series, and I added a section to uh, the original JFK in Vietnam on this, that the Joint Chiefs had deliberately helped raise questions about the, the need for any air cover. Now, these are generals that, that were at Normandy and in, in, in the Pacific and knew that any amphibious operation would fail without air cover. Okay, and so what, they're, what they were up to was to push Kennedy into a corner and make him blink, just as he had done on Laos. The idea was to get the brigade on the beachhead and have them being slaughtered and present that to the president and say, what are you going to do? And they, their calculation was that he would have to change his mind and send in the Marines and the Air Force. That was the plan. And what happened was he didn't blink. And they got stuck there on the bridgehead. Castro was ready with all of his tanks and his artillery, and, they, and, and, and Kennedy didn't authorize the Marines and the Air Force to go in. And that was the beginning of the end. Um, the national security apparatus uh, it was like an earthquake. 
He's going to fire everybody at the CIA. He's going to fire all the chiefs except for Shoup, the Marine Corps Commandant. He was a guy that liked Kennedy. Kennedy liked him. They're all going to lose their jobs. They know it. And um, things are going to change drastically. But what it does um, uh, is going to is everything's going to go to Vietnam after that, right? Cuba's done. Laos is done. But I need to tell you a few um, things here and there about that. Um, one thing, okay, let's go to uh, the Bay of Pigs or less. Yeah. That's what happened to the main supply ship. That's where all their weapons and ammunition were. Um, go ahead, Jay, keep going. And, uh, half of them, those that didn't get killed on the beach were all put in jail. Okay, let's go. Now, JFK was not a wimp, okay? You know what this is? Berlin, Checkpoint Charlie, that's it. And the Soviets had started pressuring him and pressuring him and in 61, uh, they, they put up the uh, uh, fence, which later became the wall, and were threatening to try and, and cut off West Berlin. And, they, and what you're looking at here are the American tanks facing the Soviet tanks. Uh, and it, it, it's, you, all you need is to throw a match into that, right? And the first tank that went backwards was a Soviet tank. Okay, so Kennedy sent him right through uh, East Germany and had Johnson on the ground waiting there to welcome him there and a couple other generals. So Kennedy was ready to go to war over Berlin. He was not somebody who was... Uh, you know, afraid to go to war. But he didn't see the reason for doing it in Vietnam. He didn't see the reasons for doing it in Cuba either. Uh, it would have broken a lot of treaties and uh, in, any, in any event, I just thought that that picture tells a thousand words right there. Let's go um, probably just, yeah, number nine. So Vietnam's the place and uh, What's happening for the rest of the year, 1961, is that his advisors are banging on his desk to send the troops that were supposed to go into Laos to send him into Vietnam. And um, he won't do it. He says no over and over and over again. Um, uh, is, that, is that number nine? No. Mm -hmm. This is number Max Taylor. Yeah. So what happens is Kennedy needs to get this guy who, who he brought into to investigate the Bay of Pigs failure. Uh, he'd been fired in the Eisenhower administration for, uh, it's not important. Uh, Kennedy brought him in and um, is gonna make him chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff eventually. But uh, he sends him to Vietnam at the end of 61 with the express job of going there and coming back with a recommendation not to send combat troops. And so he go, Taylor goes to Vietnam, comes back and recommends sending combat troops under a flood relief cover. There have been, been floods. Kennedy was very angry with General Taylor about that. And Kennedy planted a story in the New York Times saying that Taylor had recommended against sending combat troops. Um, in any event, uh, what, what we have done here is to reach a climax, okay? Kennedy is really alone in his administration. Everybody wants him to go into Vietnam. He won't do it. He sends Taylor out there with a job to help him do that. Taylor doesn't do that. So Kennedy basically explodes. Uh, you can put the, just the pause slide on here. Um, what he does uh, eventually is called the Thanksgiving Day Massacre. He's already fired most of the chiefs and now he fires, and, and CIA, and now he fires just about everybody in the State Department that had anything to do with Vietnam. And then he brought the people he had fired into the Oval Office and all the replacements into the Oval Office. And they're sitting there waiting. And he comes in and it's really short and sweet. He says, now I want one man to take charge of my Vietnam policy. Who's it going to be? If you, you either get with my policy or you get out. And McNamara puts up his hand. He says, I'll do it. Mr. President, I'll do it. And so from that moment on, we have a, a presidential directive, and Sam 263, which we'll look at uh, a little bit later. Uh, excuse me, uh, not 263, uh, 111. 
uh, which is that there. I think you've got it in your, uh, your packet. Uh, and he creates MACV, the Military Systems Command Vietnam, to beef up the, uh, um, the military advisory group in Vietnam. And a lot of helicopters, a lot of equipment, and the saying going around the halls of the Pentagon is, we can have anything we want but combat troops. And that was the truth. That was the line in the sand. And the Joint Chiefs were so angry about it that they sent him a nat what I call a stink bomb of a memo in January uh, through McNamara, who was the Defense Secretary. McNamara said he refused to sign it, but he sent it on to, the, to President Kennedy. And what it said is, uh, Mr. President, you need to send six combat divisions to Vietnam right now. And if you don't do that, everything from Tokyo to New Delhi is going to fall. And there, you need to really embrace that and understand what that, what that means. That's pretty bad. Right? The only thing worse I can think of is they're coming across the Rio Grande or something, you know? Really. That's saying a whole lot, that the free world in the entire East Asian landmass is going to go under. And so it was in that context that Kennedy said, not only no, but hell no, I'm not doing it. Um, and we'll bear that in mind as we, we go through 62 and 63, because it's only going to get worse. But that was the day he drew the line in the sand. And Sam 111 defined his policy. We will not Americanize the war. We will help the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, do their, to, to win their war. But the problem is, how many Viet Cong are there? You've got three options in Vietnam, right? We go in and we, we fight the war for them. Number two, we help them fight the war. Number three, we withdraw. Well, option one is off the table. Lie in the sand. Option two, help them. Well, that won't work if there's too many Viet Cong. And that's the whole issue now. What you're going to tell McNamara and Kennedy about the Viet Cong. How many are there? And what are they doing? Um, how are we doing here? Sure. Okay, so um, right about the time of that, that JCS stink bomb, um, something funny begins to happen. And it's really not funny, but uh, I call it the optimistic interlude. Um, and we just wait till the uh, uh, back channel I'll give you the cue for the Burris thing. Um, so at the third sec the Secretary of Defense Conference, the new ambassador, Nolting and General Harkins, who's commander of this new organization, MACV Military Systems Command, Vietnam. Uh, they kick off the conference, it's in Honolulu, and they say we're winning in Vietnam. Now, the advisors that Kennedy was sending over there had hardly arrived yet, or maybe a hundred of them, in tents at Saigon Airport. So how do we go from the entire East Asian landmass going down the toilet a few weeks later to we're winning the war? Lying, how about that, lying. The whole situation has now changed, and it's gonna stay that way. This optimistic interlude will last until two days before the Kennedy assassination. That's the day they're gonna tell the truth about what's happening. Um, so at that same uh, SecDev conference, though, um, McNamara is sitting there waiting for the intelligence chief at, at MACV to come up and give his briefing. Now, this guy was put in a place, put in the job for the intelligence, the intelligence chief, because he didn't know anything about intelligence. He was a sack bomber. He knew nothing about ground order of battle and, and counterinsurgency, he knew nothing. He was just a yes man and would do what he was told by Harkins. And so, Winterbottom goes up there and gives some statistics for the Viet Cong, three different ones, ranging from 12,000 to 28,000. Now, McNamara is visibly upset, right? He knows 10 to 1. 28,000 times 10 equals 280,000. And the, Viet, the South Vietnamese Army is 150 to 170. They're having a hard time getting them up to 170. So what that means is, would mean is, is that option two is stillborn. Won't work. So he's got all these different, so McNamara says, why do you have all these different figures? How come we don't know? what it is. And he says, because we don't have any good order of battle people, which just about brought the chiefs out of their chairs, because we got all kinds of good order of battle people all over the world. Um, and so McNamara gets very upset, 
And he says, okay, before I get on my plane tonight, I want the names of our best order of battle people everywhere. And that's when Bill Benedict got pulled out of his job in, in Axie and, and, uh, and George Allen got pulled out of DIA and Lutetia got pulled out of user pack and all these guys who were great all of a sudden had to leave their families and go out there to Saigon to plus up what was already a new intelligence effort out there. And for six weeks, under the direction of Allen and Benedict, they went through all 44 provinces of South Vietnam and did an order of battle on the Viet Cong. Uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna play football at that point. Everybody knows football. It, knowing, you know, battalions and, and, and regiments and all that stuff is a little different than touchdowns and field goals, right? Mm -hmm. So I've done this in my classes a lot, so it really works. If we play football with the with the intelligence estimates, it makes a lot more sense. Anyway, one thing I you go ahead and put that burst thing. The the truth was getting out of the user pack bulletins back to one person in Washington we know for sure, the vice president. His military aide, Colonel Burris, was sending him, and this is just one example, I have like eight or nine of them in the book, uh, that has the exact statistics on how bad it is and what's going on on the battlefield. But not McNamara and not the president. But the vice president, he knows what's going on. And that's a very disturbing thing. Uh, in the middle of this study, um, go ahead and put up uh, 13. Yeah, it's in your packet, but this is a great quote. Uh, he was a, uh, a really, really uh, good economist, a uh, Keynesian economist that, that Kennedy liked um, and relied on to put together his economic team, which I'm looking into now for volume three of my, my current series. But, but anyway, he sent him off to be ambassador to India, but he kept corresponding with Kennedy. And it's about this time that Kennedy sends him out to Vietnam. He does send him once or twice during, during 62. And Galbraith writes him this letter. The Soviets couldn't be more pleased to have us spend our billions in these jungles where it does us no good and them no harm. Incidentally, who is the man in your administration that decides what countries are strategic? I would like to have his name and address and ask him what is so important about this real estate in the space age. You know, and that's Galbraith. That's a, that's the way he was, and uh, and so Kennedy was actually told him he agreed with him and called a meeting and re and figured out real fast he better keep his mouth shut. So so uh, everybody jumped on him and said, no, you can't do that. You you can't turn turn around what we're doing. And so he said, okay, you know, my bad. And uh, but you can what what you do get out of this, you, it, you do see Kennedy's intent. And what he's going to do is just be quiet with it, okay? And so the game goes on. Um, and so we come to the next, um, the next SecDef <laughs> conference. All right. Where's my interns? Here we go. I got two of you, right? You have something to write, write, write on? Yeah, it could just be on the back of a piece of paper. doesn't matter. We're going to play football here. Okay, well, I'll give you mine. Or I've got it. Here. You okay? You good? Both kind of stuff to write with? Okay, so the first thing, this is the, uh, the map that was used to brief McNamara. We call it the measles map. And I got this guy, I told him, I, he declassified it for me on the spot when I asked for it, the CMH in Washington. But this was the falsified map. Uh, they falsified all the figures. I'm going to show you that in the next couple of slides. Uh, but when they walked in the night before McNamara got there for the command rehearsal, they had forgotten that there were these two, uh, these are four by eight sheets of plywood and um, that had these maps on them. And uh, they, had, they had forgotten to adjust the map. The map still had all the, the, the real Viet Cong forces everywhere. And Harkins says, oh my God, we can't show that to McNamara, which became a subtitle in chapter 13. And, um, and so while everyone had to sit there and watch in front of the entire command, Harkins gives the orders while well, Winterbottom goes up and peels off the acid, especially this stuff. That's Viet Cong control. And they put it all white stuff, you know, government control all around Saigon. And, uh, and I had an eyewitness who was there, the NSA guy was there, Bill Colby, who later became the director of the CIA. He was actually in the room that day. And uh, I can say his name now. Uh, his name was actually Tom Glenn, the NSA uh, tech rep. He was there that day, and I actually worked with him in NSA. And he, he told me, yeah, I saw it. I saw what they did that day. 
And uh, so yeah, they, they, this, this looks bad enough, right? But it was much worse than this. This is the falsified map that they actually showed the McNamara. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Now, this is the pertinent part, and I believe I put this in your packet too. Uh, if you can't read all this stuff up here. This is a comparison of the Viet Cong operations in the field versus the South Vietnamese government forces. Okay? And you really have to look at this thing pretty closely to, to see what's going on here. So, here we have the bad guys. The review of Viet Cong military activities. Since 14 April, this is 62. Since 14 April, there have been no VC operations as large as the battalion size. None. The largest one they had was only 50 guys. Present Viet Cong organized strength was estimated 16,500. Uh-uh. It was 50,000. Finally cut down to 16,500. Now, why do you think that he's, Harkins is using that number? Let's go ahead and times it 10. And what do you come up with? The number of 165,000, which is just the size of the South Vietnamese Army. Now, let's go over to the good guys. Royal Vietnamese Armed Forces. Since 21 March, there have been... 40 operations of battalion of larger size. We're not going to get out of them. We're just get, killing them. Along with 400 field goals. You know? Uh, and the Air Force has done this and, and so on. So you've got one field goal versus uh, 40 touchdowns and 400 or several hundred field goals. It's not a contest, is it? And this is what's being briefed to McNamara. But it... That those very perceptive among you will notice the dates. So if I went home and said, oh, "Honey, well, I was it, the football game at James Madison was pretty good. Um, uh, you know, we really uh, did really well in the second half. You know, we got we got all these uh, touchdowns and stuff." My wife, my wife might say, "Well, what happened in the first half, right?" <laughs> Maybe <laughs> we got pretty wrapped up with that football team for several years. Uh, I did. Um, now, since 14 April, so we're, here we are at, at basically end of the first week in May, right? So f since 14 April till the end of the first week in May, how many weeks is that? Roughly? Three. three. Okay. Now, that's the bad guys. You're going to get three weeks of data for the bad guys. Now, now for the good guys, since 21 March up to about the end of the first week in May, how many weeks is that? About three. six. Yeah, it's got both halves of the game. But you don't get the first half of the game for the VC. Now guess what? The guy at the CMH gave me these maps. Let's put the next one up. And this happens to be a map of Spring 62 Viet Cong operations in the field. Wow. Okay. So, um, Connor, you're going to be the guy who writes down, we're not even going to do field goals. We're just going to do touchdowns. And, 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 uh, Simon, I just want you to write down the dates and be prepared to give us a, a range of dates at the end of that, okay? So here we go. <laughs> okay, forget that. Uh, here, uh, 6 April, so one hash mark for a, a touchdown. 2 April. 13 April. 9 April. 2 April, 1 April, 29 March, 6 April, 9 April, 4 April, 29 March. How many touchdowns? 11. 11 touchdowns. Wow. Um, and the date range, please. Uh, March 29th to April 13th. You mean the first half of the game. What does that look like, even to a non-military person? Where are these attacks occurring in South Vietnam? Everywhere. You know what we call that in military terms? An offensive. It was the largest <laughs> offensive of the war to date. They've just wiped out of the books. Eliminated by this fancy date range thing. So not only did they cut the numbers down to 16,500, but they just... Uh, lied about what the Viet Cong was actually doing 
the breadth and the length of South Vietnam to the Secretary of Defense. He went out onto the tarmac to get on his plane. He says, I've never been so encouraged in, in all my visits with Mac Lee. So I was happy that, that the guy at CMH could back up the exact story that these officers told me that they did. And that's when I sent Chapter 13 to McNamara and got the, his denial. Where are we going from here? Um, okay. Now, uh, battle that back. Go ahead and put that, that slide up. So there's a, um, it's going to be uh, 19. Uh, there was a battle where two companies, which is about less than 300 Viet Cong, ripped up uh, three battalions of South Vietnamese ground forces supported by the 9th Cav, our most elite uh, air assets in Vietnam. We lost a lot of Americans, we lost five helicopters, and that one right there is the command ship of the 9th Cav on the ground of the Battle of At Back. At the press conference afterwards, uh, the press reporters were asking tough questions and Harkin said, come on, get on the team. You know, uh, and so, but it was too late. This, the, you know, um, the truth was getting out in the press. Kennedy was asking for unfiltered access to all of the uh, cables coming out of uh, CIA in, in, in uh, Saigon. Uh, the Central Intelligence Agency was impugning MACV's figures. Kennedy was sending people out like Senator Mansfield and others, and they came back telling the same story. It was, it was all hell was breaking loose is what was going on in military terms. But it wasn't just military. What happened uh, two months later in the spring, um, South Vietnam is basically 99% Buddhist. And after the French collapse, what happened at Geneva in 1954 is this, the country was split in half. And all the uh, northern educated, French-speaking, Catholic Vietnamese came down and took over all the power positions. And so what happens in the spring of 62, the, the Catholics are celebrating their, their religious holidays and flying their flags. And the Buddhists try to pull theirs out and they, they won't let them do it. And um, you are alienating here the entire population of South Vietnam. In any event, they, they made some demonstrations. And we can go to the next slide now. And uh, so they, they gassed them with mustard gas and ran over them with armored personnel carriers killing women, men, and children. And it caused a huge problem. Um, and next one, please. The Buddhist monks, the senior Buddhist monks, would appear at intersections, and their 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 colleagues would douse them in gasoline. And the guy that he lit the match himself. And they were doing this about one a week through the late spring and summer of 1963. So the political bottom fell out in South Vietnam because of the Buddhist crisis. Now, when I first wrote Volume Two, what I knew of the Kennedy withdrawal plan was that he was going to trickle out a thousand guys during the election campaign of 1964 in order to silence the left, the people criticizing him for getting us in there uh, in the situation in the first place. And then pull everybody out in 65 after the election so the people on the right side of the aisle couldn't argue against him. That was his plan. But the Buddhist crisis changed everything. Now he needs to get, he needs to, to, to withdraw the first 1,000 immediately in order to put it in concrete. And he needs a recommendation to do that. And so he sends Taylor, again at this time with McNamara, to Vietnam. Let's see, am I going to, we're going to just pause here. So they go out there, and again the mission is to go out there, look around, go around the countryside, talk to peasants and count their ducks and chickens and stuff, and come back and say, uh, we can get out now, we're winning the war. So what, what Kennedy wants to do is to take the story of success for which he was the target to prevent him from pulling out and, judo style, use it as the excuse for pulling out. We're winning? Good. We can come home now. <laughs> so they do. They go out there and they do that and they have this big report that they've written up and about halfway across the Pacific uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, William Sullivan, 
uh, encounters McNamara in the plane and says, you can't do this. We're not getting out of Vietnam. We've got to send more people in. And McNamara says, oh, yeah, right, right. We'll, we'll, we'll take this out of the report. And he does at the time. At the Kennedy Library, you can look at the McNamara Taylor report and see that it indeed is gone. The, the withdrawal plan is, is not, in the, not in the report. Anyway, so they get to the back to Washington. The helicopter lands on the South Lawn. They march in with a big leather-bound mm -hmm. book. Everybody's sitting there for a photo op, and then Kennedy and McNamara get up, leave the room, go into the other room, and put the put the withdrawal plan back in the back in the report. And there's a big, big mm -hmm. cat fight that takes place in the White House that day. And McNamara is sent out onto the steps to make the announcement, but not as Kennedy's, but as his own recommendation. And Kennedy actually is going to approve it a few days later secretly. He doesn't want anybody to know because he still hasn't figured out how he's going to play this in the election campaign. But he's, he's got to pull, pull the first thousand out before in 63 or he's not going to ever be able to get them out. Okay, so that's what's changed. So let's go ahead to go to 263 real quick. Uh, what are we going to do here? There it is. This is the, uh, you've got this one, I'm sure, in your packet, too. This middle paragraph here is, he, the president approved the military recommendations contained in 1B13 of the McNamara Taylor Report. And those recommendations are 1,000 out by end of 63 and, and here in this area of the report, everybody out in 65. Now, that decision was made on October the 5th. The announcement made by McNamara was October the 2nd. Right? He sends McNamara out to make the to make the recommendation. That's his that's his optimism, not mine. But secretly, he does this on the fifth of October. Usually, when you have a presidential national security me memorandum, it's going to be on the same date. It was on the fifth, and here they're not putting it in writing until October the eleventh because the intervention is found out and leaked it to the newspapers. <coughs> so Kennedy's national security advisor, with George Bundy said, Mr. President, if it's in the newspapers, we might as well put it down in the document, too. So they did. And this is it. This is the document. This is the withdrawal order from Vietnam approved by Kennedy. And we go one more. <coughs> and we actually have... Go back. We missed one. Go back to... Yeah. So this is actually minutes of the meeting on the 5th. And it's unambiguous. Uh, the president said that our decision, not our thinking about, but our decision to take those first uh, thousand guys out should not be raised for with them. Instead, carried out routinely. So he doesn't, right? What he's done is he's clamped a secrecy uh, requirement on this for the time being until he figures out what he's going to do. Um, so this came out, by the way, these documents two months before my book went to galleys. Nice timing for me. Um, okay, let's go ahead to all the way to, to 29. So uh, I'm going to have to skip it. Uh, the, the assassination of Diem, the coup, is going to take, it just takes too much time, but it, it happened um, and it required a review of policy, obviously, when the regime was toppled. You have to question whether it requires a change in our policy <coughs> towards Vietnam. And so that was done at, at Honolulu um, on 20 November 1963. Um, McGeorge Bundy was there, and um, he t his typewritten notes of MSAM 273 I have, and I've got hold of him, and I believe Ali transcribed the telephone transcript of the of the interview but he acknowledged that it, it was his his typewriter and uh, this is a uh, this is the first one right Jay is this yes. uh, 29 yeah that's okay 20. Um, yeah just stay there so it's it's several pages uh, the, the first part of it is pretty benign doesn't really say very much uh, go to the next page Uh, there's something wrong here, Jake. Wait a minute, go back. I, I gave you the wrong. I'm in 25. Okay, 25. Yeah, that's the that's the final insan. Is this 25? Yep. Okay, this is McGeorge Bundy's typewriter, 
And you can see that Kennedy is one day away from a bullet, a couple of bullets, maybe a lot of bullets, in Dallas, Texas, 11-21-63. This is the original version of the NSAN that came out of Honolulu. And um, let's go next one, Jay. Page two. Most of these are happy and glad until you get to paragraph seven. That's the next, next one. one. Okay. With respect to action against North Vietnam, there should be a detailed plan for development of additional government of Vietnam resources, not American resources, government of Vietnam resources, right? They put on the table, the war's being lost, it's critical in the Delta, we need to intensify the war effort. George Bundy knows his boss, so he takes back to his boss a recommended version of this NSAM, this new presidential order, where whatever we do against North Vietnam is going to involve additional government of Vietnam resources. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? You see these two hash marks in there? Okay, that's not happy to glad. That's like get rid of that paragraph completely. I said, Mr. Bundy, who told you to do that? And he said, Lyndon Johnson. And uh, that was on the weekend of Kennedy's assassination. Let's go ahead, keep going now, Jay. You keep going one more time. That was after the assassination. No. Or before. It's, it's the weekend of the assassination. So that uh, would have, the, the actual hash marks would have been done after the assassination, but the, the document itself was before. Right, but okay. the hash marks came Correct, out. he's going around, getting everybody, he's going to the sec def, he's going to all the, the decision makers, the policy makers, getting their input on his draft. And so Johnson told him to get rid of that. Go, go ahead, this is the final version now. November 26th is Monday. Monday after the previous Friday when Kennedy got shot. Let's go. Next one. And paragraph seven now. Planning should include, doesn't even, the, 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 the subject's even gone. North Vietnam is not even there anymore. But you see it here, so it came back in. But anyway, planning should, what you need to do is pretend that you're a war planner. That this is the presidential order for what you can do when you're a senior war planner in the Pentagon, and this is what you're able to, to work with. And what we want to do is to in, uh, include different levels of possible increased activity. And in each instance, what's it going to do to North Vietnam? How can we deny it? Possible North Vietnam retaliation and other stuff. So what is it? What is it? What can you do here if you're a war planner? Anything you want. <laughs> There's no restriction on here. There's no limiting it to South Vietnam forces. Let's go ahead, next, next slide. Again, next one. Okay, and just so you can see, you can just look at it. If you're a war planner and you see this, you can only do certain things. You see this, you can do whatever you want. You can Americanize the war. And that's exactly what happens before the weekend's over. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Is it going to be... What is it going to be? Yeah. So, uh, one of the biggest things that came to me in the second edition, as we retyped this manuscript, was the role of General Taylor. In the time between NSAM 263 in October 1963, and the assassination, and what happened in Honolulu, General Taylor does two things. Number one, he guts the 1,000 man withdrawal plan. And instead of real units, it's just uh, paper shuffling, people coming, uh, their assignments are up and other people coming back in. So it's just, it, he guts the withdrawal plan. That's one, and he doesn't tell McNamara. He tells Admiral Felt, out at SyncPAC and others, but he does not tell his boss McNamara, so McNamara and Kennedy are not told that the withdrawal plan has been good. And Kennedy was specific <coughs> that it had to include real units. Number two, 
During that same time frame, he ramps up a program called Up Plan 3463, it becomes 34A. And this is the Americanization of the war. About a hundred different operations from little pinpricks to the B-52s. And attacks along the coastline of North Vietnam. And NSAM 273 version 2 opens the door for that. But he doesn't tell McNamara the whole time that he's doing that. And McNamara doesn't know, and President Kennedy doesn't know. The General Taylor has gutted the withdrawal plan and put in place what is about to happen. Uh, a week later, uh, President Johnson, uh, go to the last, next slide, he orders uh, 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 Marine Corps Commandant Krulak, uh, he's not the Commandant, he's the uh, Head of Counterinsurgency, to go ahead and put the plan together. And within uh, a couple of weeks, the first uh, uh, U.S. Navy raids against the coast of Vietnam are away. Okay, and the, the second round of them uh, in early summer has happened in the Gulf of Tonkin, you may know about this, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, a blank check from the Senate and the House of Representatives to President Johnson to go to war, to make war against North Vietnam. But it all happened right there in, in December 63, and it was NSAM 273 that opened the door for that, okay? While Kennedy's body was still in the casket, in state, in the rotunda of the Capitol building is when Johnson did it. And that's it. All I have.